Today on Would You Believe It? Hear horrifying reports of ghostly visits at Gettysburg, America's most haunted battlefield, where spirits of old enemies still linger to haunt unwary visitors. Discover the true tale of an English mermaid who became a priest. See the world's most fragile works of art, over 3,000 pieces of intricately detailed flowers made of glass. Travel to the New England town, which became a test subject for alien experiments, where a terrifying series of close encounters are documented in never-before-seen police reports. And join an elephant-obsessed peanut salesman on his quest to find out just how many elephants you can fit in a one-room museum. Visit the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected on Would You Believe It? It seems that aliens are attracted to the desert. So apparently are the secret government agencies that deal with visitors from space. Here at Groom Lake in Nevada, otherwise known as Area 51, UFO watching has become a way of life and part of America's culture. Strange, then, that this story of UFO encounters takes place not in the lonely deserts of America's West, but here, in New England. America's historical and psychological heartland of all that is respectable and conservative. This is Exeter, home of the Phillips Academy and founding place of the Republican Party. There were no signs here celebrating visitors from other worlds, no clues as to Exeter's key place in UFO lore. Yet here, in 1965, the people of Exeter were subjected to a series of close encounters that to this day provide some of the most compelling and conclusive evidence in the history of American UFO sightings. Exeter has the outward appearance of a respectable college town, but its residents share a secret. We are not alone. Exeter Police Station, September 3rd, 1965. In the early hours of the morning, a frightened young man named Norman Muscarello burst through the door in a state of extreme agitation. He had a wild story to tell. He had been hitchhiking from Boston to his home in Exeter when he had been followed by lights in the sky. He was walking along the road and this brightly lit red object kind of took a nosedive at him. Uh, not knowing what it was, it didn't make any sound, he took cover by a stone wall next to a house. Uh, the object then moved over and hovered over the roof of the house, bathing the entire area in red light. The object eventually came up from the top of the roof, raised up a little bit, and headed out across the field and settled down into behind the tree line. As this aerial photograph shows, there was a cut in the woods for power lines. It was into this hiding place that the craft had settled. Back in the field, an eerie silence descended. Eventually, Norman flagged down a lone passing car and was driven into Exeter, where he headed straight for the police station. Officer Scratch Toland was the desk sergeant that night. Now, Scratch knew Norman and knew he wasn't the type of young man that would be easily intimidated, and he could see that Norman was excited and something really did happen. So he called uh, Officer Gene Bertrand, who's a patrol officer that night on duty, called him back to the PD. So Gene came back, talked with Norman, and they decided to go back to the site to see if they could see what was there and you know, kind of check it out. Norman and Officer Bertrand drove back out to the spot on the lonely highway, an otherwise unremarkable field that would forever be burnt into Norman's memory. Eugene parked the car adjacent to the field that the object went across, and both of them got out. And they walked out well, maybe one-third of the distance out into the field. The first sign that something was wrong was from the stables. The horses were kicking their stalls and whinnying. They were afraid. Norman was looking in one direction, and Eugene was looking in the other direction. And before you know it, Eugene heard Norman yell out something like, there it is. He spun around at the same time that Norman was looking out and they saw this brightly lit red object come up above the tree line and start heading right towards him. Officer Bertrand decided that it would be in their best interest to get to the safety of the police cruiser. The two men ran back and took cover just as the ship flew over them. Bertrand described the motion of the silent craft as like a leaf falling. 
This description has been repeated in intervening years by many UFO witnesses. Officer uh, Dave Hunt was, was uh, in the area, heard the radio traffic, and was en route to the scene, uh, and got to the scene just as Norman and Eugene were getting back in the cruiser. And he observed the craft pass over the cruiser heading in the direction of, of Hampton. This is Eugene Bertrand's report of that night. So there it was, uh, two officers uh, and a young man seeing a, a craft moving at uh, slow speed, low in altitude, bright red, didn't resemble anything that they ever saw flying around, uh, passed over the cruiser, headed out towards Hampton, and that basically was the sighting. This experience was repeated all across Exeter that night as people looked to the skies to see a strange red craft. It seemed that this quiet New England town had been chosen for alien observation. Sightings continued for the next few weeks. Those who were curious but hadn't seen anything gathered here at Shaw's Hill to watch the skies night after night. Few went home disappointed. Many theories were suggested as to why Exeter had been chosen. Some mentioned its proximity to Pease Air Force Base. Others wondered about a nearby nuclear power plant, but nobody knew for sure. Today, the question is not why Exeter, but where next? This flowering Californian pepper tree is one of the most intricate pieces of art in the world. These delicate and stunningly realistic Rocky Mountain maple leaves were created by master craftsman Leopold Blaschka and his son Rudolf. These leaves, are made of glass. Although this piece was made over a hundred years ago, it has astounded modern experts in the field of glassworking. Even with current technology, it is impossible to create such a fragile thing of beauty. The Blaska flowers are the finest achievement, the finest piece of work I have ever seen. Putting the leaves together or putting details together is one thing, but then add all the details, the fine lines or the fine uh, things sticking out. I cannot see how this could be done without melting the ones so close nearby. They must have used the absolute tiniest flame there is. I still cannot figure out how they really have done it. It is an unbelievable triumph of the artist over his material. Yet what is most incredible is that these pieces are part of a set comprising 3,000 such works of art, the most astounding collection of glass art in the world. Here at Harvard University, the entire set is on display for students and visitors. Named the Ware Collection of Blaska Glass Models of Plants, they are more popularly known by the simple title, The Glass Flowers. Leopold Blaska was a glassmaker from Saxony. His first models were sea creatures for dry aquaria. This squid was commissioned by H.G. Ludwig Reichenbach in Dresden. The models were so popular that they became a big business for the Blaschka family, so son Rudolf was drafted in to join the team. The Blaschka's work relied heavily on the botanical and zoological work of Darwinian artist Ernst Haeckel. With his help, they were ready for their biggest commission. George Goodale, director of Harvard's Botanical Museum, heard of Blaschka's work and knew it would be perfect for his university. The only obstacle was the small matter of paying for such a collection. He persuaded Elizabeth and Mary Ware to become benefactors. This bouquet was made as a gift from the grateful Blaskas to the Wares and is the only signed piece in the collection. Although the exact methods of the Blaskas remain a secret, their basic techniques can be seen. First, a flat piece of glass is pulled from a melted rod. The glass is then shaped, in this instance, into a leaf then paint is applied. This piece will be a petal in the completed flower. Detail is then painted in, and the petals are bunched together. Finally, the flower is assembled, but this isn't the end of the process. Now the green stalk must be made from a tube of glass. This is the workshop where such a transformation was made complete. Their construction required heavy tools more ideally suited to a foundry. Their materials, superheated non-crystalline silica-based compounds. Using this manually pumped burner, Leopold and Rudolph were to turn out over 3,000 botanical models. And here they are, remarkably preserved in their original display cases, 
laid out as if they are pages from a textbook. This orchid was the first flower of the collection. The curators held their breath anxiously as it was unwrapped after a 4,000 mile journey in the days before bubble wrap. Thankfully, it was in one piece, and soon many more were to follow. As delicate as the flowers and leaves are, perhaps the pinnacle of the Blaska's achievement can be seen in the renderings of insects. Every wing, every limb, every hair on these insects is made of glass. Leopold Blaska died in 1895 but Rudolf devoted his life to continuing the work until he too died in 1939. Now their secrets are lost and may never be recovered. Thankfully, their work remains. The afterlife is a great mystery. Do ghosts truly remain here on earth to walk among the living? Are there some for whom death is a closed door, so they are forced to remain here, waiting for a peace that will never come? In the field of parapsychology, there are many circumstances that are thought to contribute to a haunting, a violent death, a life cut short, perhaps an extreme of emotion or energy at the very instant that life is extinguished. Here on the battlefields of Gettysburg, all those terrible factors combined when in three days over 50,000 men were killed or injured. Theirs were not easy deaths. The war was a turning point in military history, combining old-fashioned tactics and new weapons. Men marched side by side onto the battlefield, and side by side they died, blown apart by clouds of shrapnel, until what remained was nothing more than a bloody red mist where once there had been a man. Lives were ended here in such vast numbers and in such traumatic and terrible circumstances that these acres can now claim to be some of the most haunted places in the world. This clump of trees is known as Reynolds Woods. This small wooded corner has seen more American casualties than any other piece of land this size in the world. It was here that Major John F. Reynolds received a fatal wound from a sharpshooter's bullet. As the sun sets and the shadows lengthen, he can still be seen walking amongst the trees, looking for his men and unaware that his rightful tenure on this earth was ended long ago. When a psychic was brought to this spot, unaware of Reynolds' fate, she experienced a sharp, unbearable pain in her back in exactly the same place as Reynolds' wound. These fields are known as Iverson's Pits, the last resting place of 512 men from the North Carolinian Brigade commanded by Brigadier General Alfred Iverson. With no advanced skirmishers to draw opposing fire and no reports from scouts to plan the attack, Iverson ordered his men into battle with the words, Give them hell. Hell it was, but not for the Union soldiers who were safely dug in behind barricades. A captain in the 23rd North Carolina Regiment later wrote, Unarmed, unled, we went to our doom. Deep and long must the desolate homes and orphan children of North Carolina rue the rashness of that hour. In the aftermath of the battle, the dead were buried in shallow graves, where the grass would always grow a deeper green and crops grew taller with such rich fertilizer. And for many years, laborers on Forney Farm, which encompassed this land, saw more than they expected on lonely evenings. Eventually, they all refused to work these fields and the farm was sold. The area most steeped in supernatural lore is surely here, a rock-strewn hillside known chillingly as Devil's Den. Sightings here invariably include a shabbily dressed barefoot man in a floppy hat. He has been identified as a Texan soldier, one of the men who attacked this formidable position against a barrage of enemy fire. One of the most horrible stories from the war and its aftermath occurred here on Seminary Hill. 
These imposing buildings were used as hospitals, where shattered limbs were hastily amputated amidst the constant den of screams and moans from those undergoing surgery. Outside, huge piles of amputated limbs and dead bodies accumulated until they reached the height of the window when they would finally be buried. It was in one of these piles, one of these unthinkable collections of decaying human remains, that a survivor was found. He had been presumed dead and thrown on the heap where he had lain for days, almost suffocating underneath the mound of death and destroyed flesh. The now crazed man died shortly after being discovered. His demented spirit remains, frozen here for eternity, struggling to come to terms with the horror of his demise. Even those who were buried on consecrated land seem to have difficulty leaving here. Visitors to this cemetery have reported a spectral blue mist hovering just above the ground. The mist lingers throughout dusk and into the night, but cannot be captured on film. Spirits can be found in many places here, yet visitors to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania often leave with more than just the memory of one secluded haunting. As night draws in over these once blood-soaked fields, the restless spirits of the men who died here emerge in such numbers that it seems hauntings are inevitable. In fact, it would be difficult to believe that there were no ghosts at Gettysburg. This is the story of the Mermaid of Butte, better known to history as the Reverend Robert Stephen Hawker, Vicar of Morwenstow. Of course, during his younger mermaid days, Hawker had yet to become a man of the cloth. In fact, not only did he not wear the clothes of a vicar, he didn't wear anything at all. Choosing to sit out here on the end of the breakwater, sporting only a rather unconvincing wig made of seaweed. Facing the cruel Atlantic Ocean, Hawker sang raucous and discordant songs to the bewilderment of anyone in earshot. He built a shack on the cliffs below his church from materials he found washed up on the beach. Here Hawker would sit throughout the night, writing poetry by the light of this lamp. Besides poetry, Hawker's other passion was for rescuing the victims of Cornwall's wreckers, criminals who would lure ships onto the rocks so they could steal their cargo while leaving the hapless crew members to die in the turbulent seas. Traditionally, victims of shipwrecks were buried on the beach where they washed up because they couldn't be given a Christian burial if it wasn't known if they were Christian or not. Hawker was outraged at this bizarre notion and decided that anyone who should happen to meet their maker in the deadly seas near his church should have a proper burial. Dragging their bodies up these cliffs, however, was no easy task. Often the bodies had been dashed against the rocks for many days and were the worse for wear. Hawker's flock wasn't easily persuaded to carry rotting body parts up these steep cliffs, so he bribed them with barrels of liquor. Here in this churchyard, the drowned seamen could finally be laid to rest. This granite cross marks the mass grave of more than 30 unfortunate seafarers who went down on the Alonso. And this ghostly white figurehead was rescued from the wreckage of another doomed ship. It's said by the locals to be possessed by the men buried beneath it, who will use this sword to kill any visitors to the grave who don't show a proper respect for the dead. Such a grisly nighttime occupation took its toll on Harker, and as he grew older, he also grew more and more eccentric. Turning his back on the mermaid lifestyle, he patrolled his parish on the back of a donkey, accompanied by his close friend, a large pet pig. He would wear a blue fisherman's jersey and long sea boots underneath a bright red coat topped off with a pink rimless hat. Obviously, his fashion sense had never improved since his seaweed phase. Hawker was often heard talking to the animals of his parish, conducting lengthy philosophical arguments with the cows, and inviting his cats into church where he'd preach to them. He realized he had gone too far, however, when he found his cat blatantly disregarding the Sabbath by catching a mouse on a Sunday. The cat was promptly excommunicated and banned from the church. Hawker, by this time, had also changed his ideas of the ideal abode, and now was given funds to build a vicarage. Widely known for his love of the arts, Hawker saw this as an opportunity to display some of his own artistic flair. Visitors should look towards the heavens if they wish to see the source of Hawker's inspiration, and also the result. All the chimneys of the vicarage represent buildings associated with Hawker's life. These represent churches Hawker had previously attended. This one, more bizarrely, is a replica of his mother's grave. Throughout his eccentric life, Hawker had one main fear, that after he died, he would be forgotten. 
which is perhaps why his ghost remains, walking these lanes clad in flowing red gown and pink hat and accompanied by his faithful pig. A spectral reminder that to be a great poet or a great hero doesn't mean you need dress sense, but a sense of humor. Robert Stephen Hawker, poet, priest, mermaid. Would you believe it? How do you get 5,000 elephants into a one-room museum? Give up? Well, here in Ortana, Pennsylvania, one man has the answer. In this small roadside store, Mr. Ed has built a collection of elephantine proportions. Mr. Ed doesn't just like elephants, he loves them. So much so that when they started taking over his home, he created a museum so that everyone can share his passion. It all started with a wedding gift over 30 years ago. Another couple of elephant ornaments picked up on the honeymoon seemed innocuous enough, but then something happened. Mr. Ed realized he'd found his calling. Elephants. Elephants in every shape and form. From the exquisite to the just plain cute. This sculpture is one of Mr. Ed's favorite pieces, and it's not difficult to see why. This piece you see here is a very, very special piece to me because Everybody says to me, Ed, you got elephants on the brain. A serious condition and the only known cure, more elephants. Some elephants have unexpected uses. One of my very favorite pieces is my elephant hair dryer. I never saw one before. I bought this 20 years ago and I haven't seen any since. It's really kind of neat because it's an actual hair dryer. It's not a toy, it was used to dry ladies' hair. And this one works. I'm going to demonstrate it for you. First thing you do is you turn on the switch back here, when you do, the light comes on the elephant so you can read your book while you're having your hair dry. And, of course, you hear the motor going down through the hose, goes the hot heat. You put the cap on and you dry your hair. Other uses are even more unexpected. A friend of mine in Chambersburg, about 12 miles from here, is an artist. And I wanted her to make me something from my museum, something I didn't have before. So I asked her, how about a potty chair? So we got a potty chair. Strangely, Mr. Ed's favorite piece of elephant-oriented art isn't of an elephant at all. That's because it's by an elephant. This is Lucy, the famous painting elephant of the Phoenix Zoo in Arizona. When she heard of Mr. Ed's love of her kind, she created a unique piece of art for him, and now it's his most prized possession. Mr. Ed's dream is to own a real elephant. Well, he certainly has enough peanuts for that happy eventuality, but until then, this white elephant is the closest he can get to life size. So, how do you get 5,000 elephants into a one-room museum? Come visit Mr. Ed, and you just might find out.